Good morning fellow mathematicians, welcome back to another video. I haven't recorded a video on this whiteboard for a while and for some reason it feels like the light is kind of low today. I don't know, it just feels weird, it looks weird on the camera, but I hope it's still okay. So, in the last video regarding analytical mechanics we have talked about a lot of stuff regarding Hooke's law. We've derived a lot of things and remember it was a conservative force, but what would happen if we would derive all the stuff for random conservative forces. So let's take a look at that today. So let's say we have a random conservative force f in terms of x and you might know that a force is nothing else than mass times acceleration x double dot. What we can do now is bring f in terms of x to the other side and see what we get. So this is now equivalent to saying we have m x double dot minus f in terms of x and this is going to be zero. And remember, we are dealing with a random conservative force and there was one thing that we've derived for conservative forces, which is the negative differential in terms of the position of some potential u in terms of x is nothing else than f in terms of x. And we can actually make use of that. So let's plug this in and see what we get. So now we have m x double dot positive d u dx and the u is in terms of x is now going to be equal to zero. And just like in the last video, we are going to multiply both sides by the velocity under the condition that it isn't equal to zero for now. So we now get m x double dot times x dot positive du dx. And remember what the velocity is, it's just dx over dt. So I'm going to write it that way, dx over dt and it's going to be zero. And it's the same procedure once again. We want to factor out a differential ddt to get some kind of energy. So this right here is going to be our simple kinetic energy we've derived before. But this right here, what is that? That looks weird. You might notice something. If those were multiplicative, those dx's, those would just cancel out. And this right here actually is the chain rule in the Leibniz's form. So this right here is nothing else than du dx dt. Okay, uh, du of x dt, sorry. So that means we get d dt of m over 2 x dot but squared plus u in terms of x and this is going to be zero. And great thing once again, kinetic energy, potential energy is going to be the total energy of the system. And once again for conservative forces we have the conservation of energy in here. It just applies every time. So that's nice. But this time we can't really say anything about classical turning points or something or when the velocity is at its highest because we have no information about u in terms of x. So instead what we could do, we could um, for example solve this differential equation once again. But at first let's take a look at a little graph of some potential. So there are many possibilities how this potential could look like. For example, we could have something nice like this right here. And once again, we have some total energy in here. And now we can see where our classical turning points are. So that would be x1 and we have x2. So one observation you could uh, take in this whole thing is that we have a marble rolling up and down once again in this potential and it could be between x1 and x2 all the time. But our x1 and x2 are dependent on our total energy level. So if our energy level would be here, those classical turning points would be somewhere else. So that means in the system we have something like x1 in terms of e and this position x of the marble is somewhere between x1 and x2. Okay, great. But it could look quite different. For example, we could have something that looks like this right here. So we have this and then it would go to infinity for example. So that means we wouldn't have a classical turning point too. So for this potential for example we would have a classical turning point here. Here's our total energy E. And we have some x1 in terms of E is between x and it could go somewhere to infinity. It can be equal to infinity. That's quite important. So potentials can look really weird in quantum mechanics it's getting even weirder. But we are going to solve our differential equation for this little case right here. Let's do it. The thing right now is 
we don't have information about u of x. So all we can do is we can isolate x dot right now and see what we get. So how do we get that? Well, we can subtract u on both sides and we can multiply both sides by 2 over m and then we can take the square root just like before. So right now we end up with x dot, which is nothing else than dx dt. So we have dx dt and this is going to be positive or minus the square root of 2 over m e minus u, I'm going to just write it as u, it's in terms of x, you know what it is. And just for simplification purposes, we are going to get rid of this right here, those signs, they don't matter for us right now. Okay, how can we continue? Just like before, we are going to divide both sides by this term under the condition that it isn't equal to zero, and it isn't because the total energy is greater than our potential energy. <laughs> And also we are going to multiply both sides by dt and see what we get. So that means we have now dx over square root 2 over m e minus u is going to be equal to dt. And now we want to integrate it because we want to solve a differential equation. So let's integrate both sides and we want to do this smartly. Remember we had a graph before. We want to take a look at the situation for this graph right here with some x1, uh, x2 and we have some x1 right here. Okay, you might have heard it before, there's something that's called a period time. What is the period time? Well, it's the time it takes for a marble, for example, to fulfill a whole period. That means it would roll from x1 to x2 and back from x2 to x1. But we can't quite integrate over this whole period time because that would mean we would integrate from x1 to x1 which, uh, which would just be zero. That wouldn't be really nice. So for example we could just take a look at half the period time which is from x1 to x2. So that means we have some t1 and we have some t2 and it's going to be capital T over 2, half the period time where the capital T is representing the period time obviously. So that means we also have to integrate from x1 to x2 right here. We can simplify it any further, to be honest, because, well, we don't have any information about the potential or the whole energy or x1 and x2. So all we can do is bring this 1 over square root 2 over m to the outside. Both are positive, both factors, so we can break up the square root. We can take the reciprocal and we can multiply both sides by 2. So what we end up with is an expression for the period time is just the square root 2 times m times the integral from x1 to x2 of dx over square root e minus u in terms of x. Okay, and that's it. So you can't really derive anything more right now unless you get information about one of those two. Most of the time you will get a potential energy and you have to solve for it. And we are going to discuss this possibility soon, soon enough. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and recommend me if you like. And if you uh, want to support me a bit more, blah, then take a look in the description. There will be a link to my corresponding uh, Patreon. I'm too dumb to speak today. It doesn't quite matter. That was just a little bonus video and I hope you guys plenty enjoyed it. Up until the next video, have a day. See ya.